to the University Alumni Association's YouTube channel. And uh, my back team is uh, Angela Demopoulos, and she's our Director of Alumni Engagement and Outreach at the Alumni Association. And there was my little visitor. Um, oh, and uh, we also have with us Matt Scassero, and he is our Director of the UAS UMD test site. And so for those of you that don't know what those acronyms stand for, stay tuned. You are going to learn so much about what's happening down here in Southern Maryland and all the advances in uh, technology that, that uh, Matt is in charge of at the UAS test site. And so with that, I'll just say again, thank you. We'll go ahead and start the recording. My name is Beverly Brown with the Southern Maryland Alumni Network for the University of Maryland Alumni Association. We're very excited to have you um, kind of get a peek into what's going on in Southern Maryland with the expansion of the University System of Maryland, Southern Maryland campus. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, we refer to it lovingly as USM squared, so USMSM. Um, and a lot of the, the innovations and uh, advancements that are taking place in unmanned aircraft are happening right here in Southern Maryland in my neck of the woods. And um, I have with me this afternoon, as I mentioned, Angela from the Alumni Association and the Vice President of our Board of Directors for the Alumni Network, Kathy Burthart is with us. Um, and we may have a couple board members joining this afternoon and if we get a chance, I'll introduce them to you as well. Uh, our goal as your alumni network for Southern Maryland is to uh, expand Terp Nation's reach into the Tri-County area of Charles, St. Mary's, and Calvert County. And we've been doing that by hosting events um, and then now doing some virtual events. Um, we still are planning to have a crab feast in late September. So fingers crossed we'll be able to, to move forward with that event. You can find some information at the Alumni Association's website under networks and then drop down and find Southern Maryland. Or you can find us on Facebook at SOMD Terps Alumni Network. And with that, I'm going to introduce you officially to Matt Scassero, who is our director of the UMD UAS test site. And I'm gonna turn it over to Matt this afternoon and he's gonna take us through some information on the, the advances in technology and the fun projects that are happening at the UAS test site and the USM Squared campus. Um, if you have questions for Matt, please feel free to put them into the chat box and periodically throughout the presentation, we'll hit him with a question or two and then we may have some additional time at the end for questions. So with that, Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you take over the show. Great, thanks very much, Beverly and Angela and the entire team there at the Alumni uh, Network uh, making this all happen. And welcome to all of you. I'm really happy that you tuned in for this uh, brief hour. I see brief because we have a whirlwind of information that I'm gonna throw out here. A lot of it's gonna be kind of 30,000 foot or 400 foot for a drone uh, kind of view, uh, top level stuff. As you'll see at the end, we really want you to come out and take a look at for yourselves at what we have going on down here. Uh, more than happy to give tours uh, to folks, uh, talk about what we're doing, whether it's for a business reason, you want to do something with us, or just to see what your University of Maryland and University System of Maryland is doing down in Southern Maryland. It has been spectacular. Uh, the first time I drove to Southern Maryland was in 1987 when I was with the Navy. There was one stoplight between La Plata and the base at Pax River down in St. Mary's County. Uh, today, it is drastically different. Uh, in just the last eight years that I've been working this specific effort, uh, we've seen a dramatic uh, change here at the airport. So with that, I do want to get jumped into it. Uh, the only other administrative kind of thing I'd like to say is uh, if anybody could, uh, or if everybody could, just make sure you're on mute just so we don't get any interference in the background. And we will be monitoring the chat uh, for any kind of questions. So I'm going to go to share screen. This is a multimedia kind of thing going on today, so please bear with me. Uh, if we uh, manage to get uh, sidetracked on something or something doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to. And I will say we have a couple other folks in the background that are helping today that will also be available to answer questions from USMSM and TechPort, two of the places I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and we'll uh, have them in the background as well. So I'll talk a little bit about them when we get to them. So 
Uh, first off, I do want to assure that even in aviation, in this time of pandemic, we do have the ability to protect ourselves. Uh, this is a great Hank Caruso uh, caricature print. Uh, Hank Caruso is a Southern Mound artist, uh, lives right down here in St. Mary's County, has been famous in the naval aviation community and other aviation communities for years. So uh, this was just a nice uh, thing we pulled from uh, some of his work there. So before I get into some of the very specific things of what the organizations are doing, I want to kind of give you some uh, context. This is something we thought about when we started planning all this activity back around 2012, 2013. Why? What difference will it make? Why get the right, who should get as partners, things like that. So we drew this map up and what we figured out is that in the state of Maryland, at least, the identification of each region of the state really depends on the partners that are there. And it really lends to the flavor of that particular region. And the other thing we found and figured out was the university system of Maryland is heavily invested in the entire state but specifically through certain institutions, it really helps identify what that region is going to do or be known for. So you can see we have the biotechnology and the cybersecurity corridors there that were known. Uh, the biotech stuff going on in Baltimore and the region up there, cybersecurity down from Fort Meade, just incredible capabilities and lots of other things going on in other parts of the state. So what we laid out was the autonomy corridor from Aberdeen, APG, Aberdeen Proving Ground, all the way down through uh, University of Maryland College Park, all the way down through Southern Maryland with Indian Head and the base at Pax River. There's a lot of work going on in autonomy writ large, not just aviation, but ground, surface, subsurface, Carter Rock uh, doing surface work as well. So we really wanted to emphasize this, but then we really wanted to pull in the USM pieces that would help us create this identity. This is something we thought about back in 2012, 2013. Today, I can very heartily say it's real. Things are happening here, but throughout the state, throughout the corridor that are making us a known identity for Maryland. And why should you care about that? Economy, jobs, the technology way of taking advantage of it. And it really takes three particular areas, the education, the research, and the investment. The great news is the statewide effort of USM is making investments in all those areas. And here in Southern Maryland specifically, uh, we have making investments in those areas as well. And you can see some of the things that are identified there. The three things that we're going to talk about today are USM, SM, University System of Maryland at Southern Maryland on the education side, but also the research. And then the technology piece with the incubator at TechPort. We'll talk about more of these. And then the actual research uh, writ large part of the UAS test site. So it is partnered with all those things working together and also you. Whatever you bring to the table, we want to work with you. University System of Maryland has five general areas that they like to focus in. And the really good thing about Tom Sadowski and the Chancellor and everybody up there that we work with is they work in these five areas, but they leave it to the locals, the institutions in those areas, the partners in areas to actually carry things out. They provide a great leadership and support role and that advocacy role, but they leave it to the partners to really make it happen. So we've had a great working relationship with USM in all five of these areas and uh, they've been really critical in making the differences happen. So this is a little bit of a dated uh, shot of the airport that we're actually located at. This is St. Mary's County Regional Airport. Uh, the basic runway, and I'm hoping you can see my cursors, uh, this white section up at the top here is a extension that is literally happening as we speak. Uh, you'll see here in a video in just a second some of the things. But the things that we're going to talk about are the U.S. test site, the Higher Education Center, which is now USMSM, and then the Techport Incubator is down in this corner here just above the uh, General Aviation Hangar Expansion uh, Code. And the reason I throw this up there is you're not going to recognize this in about a year because so much is going on. And to show you a little bit about uh, what those things are that are going on, I wanted to show you a construction video. And this is where the multimedia part comes in. And hopefully this works. So there is no sound to this particular one, so I'll just kind of narrate it. This is a drone flight over the St. Mary's County Regional Airport coming in on the approach end of runway 29. That is the Southern Maryland Higher Education Center. What used to be that, it's now University System around Southern Maryland, the two buildings that exist. The third building is in that trees area uh, that's just off to the uh, upper part of that uh, part. All of that construction you see there is actually all complete. This was all done, this flight was flown about three months ago all of this construction is done. 
So the airport runway has been widened, the roads have been moved. Uh, here, that red striped building in the top center, that is the UAS test site. To the left of it, two doors down, is the Techport Incubator. All of the rest of these buildings in the back here were not there in 2014 when we officially stood up under the University of Maryland. It was a runway and six or seven hangars up front here, and that was it. All of these projects have been waiting on the books, some of them for 15 years. And when we, the University System, the University of Mount College Park decided we're going to invest in the airport, put things there, put people there, all of the other projects from the county, the state, and the FAA came online and they all pulled the trigger and they're all executing now. The runway expansion is going to happen off this end of the runway, off towards uh, the uh, West End, I think it is. Uh, so all of this will become tarmacs and hangars and things like that up here in this end. So I just wanted to show you that to show you kind of a big picture view of the, what we're doing at the airport. So now, uh, talking about the first of these three areas, the University System of Maryland at Southern Maryland, uh, used to be known as the Southern Maryland Higher Education Center, a regional education center. The acting director is Ben Latigo, Dr. Ben Latigo. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us today. He's uh, working with MHEC today. Uh, we do have Jean Combs uh, on the call today, so if there's any questions I can't answer, she has supplied me with tons of information. I'm also on the board of advisors at USMSM, so I have some knowledge, but uh, if we have something I can't answer, I'm going to throw the uh, ball to Jean and see what she can do with it. So the focus of the USMSM is exactly what you see here. It is to provide an education resource for Southern Mount. It actually started when the BRAC happened down here in Southern Mount and the base at Pax River took on a huge expanse of our mission, the number of people. And I was actually kind of in and out of that expansion when I was still in the Navy before I left the Navy in 2009. So they created this higher education center to support the workforce. We doubled the size of St. Mary's County's population in seven years because of RAC. So we had no education resource at that time. Uh, we had a community college up in Charles County at the time, which has now become the College of Southern Maryland. Uh, a lot of stuff has happened just in that short period of time. Uh, but this institution was created to support the education needs of the workforce. And ever since then, we've been gnawing away at the edges of what more could we do? What more could we expand? I'll talk more specifically about the merger that happened last year with the University System of Maryland to make us the third regional education center. Uh, but I'll talk some more about the programs. It started off as this workforce training, supporting the Navy workforce defense contractors, and has since become much, much more than that. So as far as the straight educational programs you can see here, uh, it's a real wide variety of programming from degree programs through professional certificates, uh, professional training for the workforce, and even community training. And a lot of community programming goes on at the site because it is the largest gathering facility in St. Mary's County. So we do run a lot of programs there. A lot of nonprofits come in to run, run programs there, uh, 90 plus academic programs. And a real interesting uh, characteristic of USMSM is that we are the only regional education center in the state that has a combination of USM and non-USM institutions that you can see a few of them listed in the center there. So we had this flexibility that was part of the regional or the higher education center when it started. And after the merger, we re have retained that capability. So when a new program comes up, it's offered to the USM schools to, off to create that program and give that program if it doesn't exist or if none of the USM schools want to do it and we can identify a non-USM institution of quality to present the program, we pull them in. So it's a really interesting mix, uh, good flexibility and allows us to do a lot of stuff. Uh, you can see we also do directly support the Naval Air Station at the Tuxin River, the workforce there, the defense contractors uh, as a lead center of technology uh, work that goes on. And I just saw something yesterday uh, from one of the uh, national ranking we are right behind Silicon Valley with STEM workforce in the entire nation as far as per capita. So we are a real hotbed of this kind of work down here. The current campus that exists today you saw in the picture is the two buildings, the buildings one and two, has a fairly sizable campus, 24 acres, uh, and that gives us a lot of room to expand. And I'm gonna talk about the new building, the third building, the research building, uh, education research, whatever term you've heard for it, a little bit more towards the end. Uh, but it's going to add tremendously, and we have room for an additional couple more buildings after that. Uh, we have a lot of classroom space. The labs uh, that I'll talk about here in the next slide, 
have been supported by the Navy quite a bit, the equipment that's in them, uh, because it is directly supporting their workforce, both the existing workforce and the future workforce. And then we do have a very large center hall area, which holds uh, several hundred people uh, that we can do large conferences, host community meetings, again, as the largest facility in St. Mary's County for this kind of work. As far as specific engineering programs from University of Mount College Park, this was something that I actually worked on when I was in the Navy side, that it became a reality uh, beginning in 1999 with mechanical engineering uh, at the master's level. And then in 2009, we added the undergrad mechanical engineering and just two years ago, we added the electrical engineering. And you can see that the graduations have started to roll. Uh, mechanical engineering is by far the most popular program. Uh, it is also the most uh, contributive program to unmanned aviation, aviation in general, uh, in those fields. So we do use a lot of aerospace engineers, electrical engineers, other engineering, software, computer engineering. But the mechanical engineers uh, seem to have the most flexibility to fit into the work that happens with the Navy, but also the work that we're doing now with unmanned aircraft systems. So the merger happened in, uh, like I said, March of last year. It was a pro work in progress for several years uh, based on a lot of people uh, down here as well as up in College Park and in the university system to make that happen. So Chancellor Kerwin was a big driver of it uh, and actually signed the agreement back in uh, 2018. It took effect last year. We, like I said, we are the third one but uh, where the regional education is, but we're the only one that's going to have a research capability, which I'll talk about here in a second. The interesting thing, and I've been pushing it really hard, uh, and luckily working with people at the College Park, they're pushing and pulling on their end as well. When you combine education, research, and the investment of things like incubators and angel fund investors, VC funds, things like that, you have a university research park. And that is the exact terminology that we're beginning to use uh, that we're starting to see resonate. Uh, and when this new building is complete, that is the direction that we are going. So the new building, it's a research and engineering building. Some have heard it called the third building. Checking time here just to make sure. Uh, so it's going to be a, re a classroom and engineering building to expand those capabilities, but then have a research component. And half of the building will actually be devoted to research into autonomous technologies of all domains. So air, ground, surface, subsurface, you name it. Uh, we're going to attract worldwide talent. Uh, it'll not just be UMD professors, but the Navy is already committed to putting some of their scientists there. Other academic institutions, industry will be putting people there. So we're really taking advantage of this partnership of people that have already been working things, especially with the Navy down here in Southern Mound, the College Park and other places, pulling all that stuff together. Uh, it's just going to be a really exciting uh, co collaboration of efforts going on. It's already under construction. You'll see here in a moment uh, some of the progress that's being made on it. Uh, and its goal is to be complete with the building by uh, fall of next year. We are on track despite COVID and actually be open for running programs in 2022. These are some artists' conceptions. You can see it is a very nice building. It is a USN UMD building. We are so happy to be seeing this going up in Southern Maryland. Uh, it's two stories uh, throughout the entire building on actually two different planes with some uh, topography in there. Uh, so you'll see a little bit more of that view here in a second. Uh, primarily, there's an education wing to the uh, right side in the lower left diagram here, and there's a research wing on the uh, left side as we look at the diagram. As far as unique facilities, Dean Pines, soon to be President Pines, uh, my boss for the last six years, uh, he wanted to push right off the bat for having unique facilities that people are going to really want to come use, uh, whether it's for UAS, ground, surface, whatever flavor of research they want to do. So these are some of the things, uh, an open air lab, an uh, AR, VR uh, lab, virtual reality kind of lab. We're having water tanks. We're having anechoic chambers to be able to seal off the research going on inside. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out electronically. So there's going to be a really good network capability uh, there because it is going to be networked with Navy labs. Army Research Lab has already said they want to be networked in as well. So well before this is complete, we already have the people weighing in to be part of this. So what I want to do now is show a short video of the progress of construction, uh, what it's envisioned to look like. So this will be about one minute, and I'll narrate over top of it. So you can see the existing one and two buildings there. This is the layout for building three. Right now we are about two thirds complete. So right about 
this point is where we are today, a little bit further, maybe about right there. Uh, that is the large convention center that you saw pop in there. Now the open air lab uh, will pop into the lower right there. So you can see it's a very extensive building, a really interesting layout, but everything is connected to everything else, physically, electronically, and people-wise. The education piece is tied in with the research piece and is tied in with the community. So now we get a little drone view here, and I, I really tried to get them not fly the drone past people's heads, but that's what they did. So uh, you can get the bird's eye or the drone's eye view of the facility. Really nice, 87,000 square feet, $84 million building. And as I said, that is uh, about two thirds complete right now. And we are tapping right along, keeping uh, track of that construction. So I'll pause there for a moment. I don't see anything in the chat window, but if anybody wanted to go live for just a second, uh, just to see if there are any questions uh, on a specific part on USMSM, and I can address questions at the end as well. Okay, so we'll press ahead here. So Techport, uh, one of the things we decided from the get-go was besides this research piece at the UIS test site, which we'll talk about last, uh, we wanted to have an incubator to really support the businesses that we wanted to attract. And even though it says UAS business incubator, it's really an all tech incubator. Uh, they've had solar power companies in there. They've had software companies in there. They've had UAS businesses in there. So it's really an incubator writ large for technology uh, companies that need support and want to be part of our innovation community that we have at the airport. So to show you a tour of the test uh, of the uh, tech board incubator, we actually have a video. Uh, so we can do that. It's about 13 minutes long. The director there is Tommy Lugendo. Uh, you'll see him here in the video. And unfortunately, he was not able to join us either today. So I'm uh, standing instead, but he'll be on the video and can tell you all about tech board. Here we go. Bob Ross here. Uh, he's an inspiration to us. Talk a little bit more about him and some of the interesting things we've done. But uh, you might see him as you walk through on this tour. On your left, uh, we've got TSI. They're a long-term tenant here and also a uh, government contractor. They do a lot of work with the Navy. Just come on back. So this is a green area. Uh, if you're a tenant or a member of this building, obviously you get full access to things like high-speed Wi-Fi, printer, copying, uh, just about anything you would need for your office. Over here on the left, this is the boardroom or the deal room as some people call it. As you'll see, some more Bob Ross, but also plenty of seating. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did here was to fog out the glass. Uh, privacy is important to certain people when they're having meetings. And this was something that we added about six months ago, and we've had a lot of positive feedback about it. And in general, uh, different folks who use this place uh, really love the setup for Zoom and Skype meetings. Uh, and this can definitely be transitioned very easily uh, and set up with any computer that someone might want to actually have a meeting with. All right, so we'll keep going. <clears throat> These right here are hot desks. Uh, for members that uh, don't necessarily need a physical office, uh, people that might travel a lot uh, but need a place to park, do their work, um, get out of the house, uh, hot desks are available, um, and there's quite a few of them. On the left, we have a tenant transitioning in, uh, the Jordans from Jordan R&D. Uh, this is going to be their office and uh, they're great people, and they've been in Southern Maryland for a long time, and they've done a lot of creative things in the community. Back here is the kitchen and uh, kind of hangout space. Uh, we are redoing the walls, so you will see there's a lot of different nicks and knacks, uh, but a local artist uh, and gallery, Solomon's Gallery, has been kind enough to 
uh, loan us some photography and some paintings and things like that. And that's why the walls are marked up for where they can be hung. Real quick, back here, uh, we, are, we are slowly but surely building a vegetable garden. Uh, kind of a nice place to hang out when it's nice out, but obviously it's a little gray today. Uh, we've got some tomatoes growing, and I'm told that uh, maybe some ginger and cinnamon plants will be next. Uh, but for now, we're just going to stick with the tomatoes. All right, so let's get to a little more of the interesting stuff now. <clears throat> got your bathrooms on the left. Won't be doing a tour of that, uh, but I would be mistaken if I didn't show you the, I guess I call this the intern grotto or the intern cave. We have Tabitha Dunn on our left, busy at work, uh, working on progress culture, which we'll talk about in a moment. You also might note that there is some lovely artwork here. Uh, this was an interesting project that the interns conducted last week where they followed our hero, Bob Ross, and uh, were able to make some really good paintings. Right here is the scrum board. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is just an agile way of planning and organizing. Um, essentially, you break things down into two week increments and you have to do list, in progress, and then complete. And at the end of every two weeks, uh, the goal is to have all the blue stickers here and the finished column here. Um, while I'm the dinosaur, he's a big, big hero of ours, and uh, I don't quite remember what's this guy's name? I, I don't don't these name. guys have names? Well, Theodore. 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 Okay, so we've got Theodore here, Baby Yoda, and my personal favorite, which is a baby T-Rex. And these were all printed here at Techport. And you guys might be wondering, why did you do this? The answer is because to calibrate these printers, uh, you have to try a lot of different unique models uh, to see if you're going to get them right so that you can actually print the parts that are needed for things like drones. All right. Now back to the hangar. Uh, the tech board is broken into office area and a hangar area, uh, but the whole, the whole building is in fact a hangar. Right here, is, this looks like the fancy 3D printer, but it's in fact the uh, less fancy of the two. Uh, it does some good prints. Obviously it can do some really big prints, but they're not as intricate as the things that are printed on this bad boy. So the Mark Forge printer, probably our most popular piece of equipment here. Uh, just for fun, you can see that you know we did print a 3D printed guitar, uh, and we were actually able to scale that, which I'll show you guys out in the rest of the hangar. But this, this printer right here, uh, the gentleman behind the camera right now, Alec Dobbins, intern, uh, he did something really creative about four months ago. He printed a face mask frame uh, for the response to coronavirus, excuse me, COVID-19. And um, that took on a life of its own, which I'll talk about in a second. All right, so out to the shop. Um, safety data sheets, your first aid kit is very important. A lot of this is brand new. Um, some of it you'll see we still aren't quite sure as far as where we're going to keep it. But for now, this is where we're at. Um, certain things can definitely be moved around. But for someone that's looking to do just about anything in terms of building in a shop, I mean, we've really got it all. Um, this is probably my favorite drawer right here. Um, I don't know how many tenants are really going to be using a wrench that's this big, but if you want it, you've got it. And this is, this is pretty heavy duty stuff. So for people that are looking to do um, just about any type of uh, prototyping, I won't say large scale manufacturing, but maybe some light manufacturing. Um, we do have everything that they need. All right, so moving on back here, uh, it's just a little work area. It provides a little bit of privacy. Uh, obviously you can still hear a lot of noise, but gives you kind of a space of your own. And uh, we keep most of the armed force flags here. You saw we have the Navy out in the front. I guess I need to get a Space Force flag now, uh, which I'm just thinking about now. This right here doesn't really look like a lot, but it's pretty interesting. Um, so two young gentlemen from uh, the Clark School, uh, who are students in the Pathways program down here in Southern Maryland, uh, came to me with an idea. And the idea was to build a battle bot. 
And so this is actually a two-scale rendering of the BattleBot. And they're gonna be working with TechPort to uh, roll it out in the next few months here. And so far, it's gonna be designed like a uh, blue crab. And so you can kind of see the shape of the crab right here. And uh, it's gonna be completely metal. And hopefully uh, competing in BattleBots uh, sometime in April of next year. All right, so this is the fun area, or at least where most people congregate. Um, one of the things that we've been doing back here weekly for the last few months is something called Progress Culture, uh, which is brought to us by Dominic Fragment and Paul Murphy, and uh, their organization, the Spirit of Innovation and Freedom. So what you don't see here right now is that they usually have a full uh, drum and guitar set up. And after they're done, done playing, we have um, a conversation section where we talk about things that uh, are non-traditional and typically we try to get people out of, their, out of their comfort zone. So I spoke a little bit about some of the cool things that we're able to do with 3D printers. This is not complete quite yet. This is actually a guitar. It's inspired by the same gentlemen that have been helping us with progress culture and uh, one of the contractors for uh, TechPort, Alex, from uh, 3D printing, he was able to print this with a wood composite. And so you can see this is actually a, a real guitar. Southern Marin loves you. Um, one of our tenants, Tracy Barkheimer, she uh, had her kids. They were kind enough to draw this for us. And Southern Marin loves you is something that was born out of TechPort uh, back in February slash March. And I talked about it briefly, but it was really born out of um, the idea that Alec Dobbins had, which was to print 3D face masks. So you might not be able to quite understand what I'm showing you here, but think about it like this. This is months ago. If you put a, if you put a cloth, you can actually cover your face and you attach rubber bands and it works as a face mask. That evolves into a lot more. Um, the group came together, we started making things like hand sanitizer. Uh, we started giving out things like toilet paper and we started making face shields, face frames and ultimately something called uh, the hot box which is uh, a giant oven used to sanitize medical equipment and currently going under uh, FDA approval. All right, another creative thing that we try to do here is have a little fun and so something that the interns worked on was building a mini golf course and since this is being recorded in just one take hopefully i'll make this let's see what we got this close this close that was on film i was about half an inch away um but for the most part uh that's really what we've been trying to do here um, so this is this is a uh, drone incubator. Um, traditionally, that's what it was formed for. But if you haven't been able to figure it out yet, we're trying to do as many unique things as possible. I mean, just take a look over here. This is another project that we uh, that we rolled out a couple of months ago, and just something to add a little life to this place. And so back here, we haven't really opened it up all the way yet because I wanted a chance to uh, to show you guys, but. The important thing is, is that this really is an airplane hangar. And our tenants, our guests, sometimes I think they forget. Uh, so when it's nice enough, we like to open up the doors. And remind people that yes, we are at an airport. And this airport goes back for a while, and there are things as unique as Harrier jets, um, some Russian jets, helicopters, World War II planes, and of course drones. And um, more than anything, uh, this place is open for people that are working on just about any type of technology. Obviously there are some things that we have core capabilities in, um, but it's, it's really supposed to be about uh, trying to help people. And so in a couple of minutes, what you'll see is uh, Matt give his presentation and show you all about his facility 
And for those of you who are watching online at a later date, we'll be sure to link to the, uh, the tour of Matt's facility. And other than that, this is it. This is Techport. So I appreciate you guys uh, coming today and watching and uh, hope to see you soon. Thanks. Okay, so that was Tommy. Uh, hopefully everybody uh, could hear and see that uh, well. Uh, Tom's a great guy. So make sure I turn off the audio. Bye. Hi, I'm Tommy Luganville. Sorry about that. Multimedia. Okay, uh, Tommy, uh, you may get the impression he's very laid back. He is somewhat laid back, but he is a go-getter and gets stuff done. He is a UMD uh, business school grad, uh, master's MBA grad from the uh, Smith School of Business, and he has just been a godsend to us down at the airport, getting a lot of things done at the incubator, but also becoming a real part of the community down in Southern Maryland. So now on to the uh, final, the best section, of course, uh, the UAS test site, unmanned aircraft system test site. Um, the, uh, this is the external view uh, to our hangar. We are the only hangar that has that big red stripe, uh, but uh, that's how we let people identify. So what are we? We're a operational flight research group. We work with industry, government, academia, the FAA, and others to figure out how are we going to get drones integrated into the national airspace. So that is our big goal in life is to help make that happen. And the way we do that is by doing work. We do projects, research projects with all those different people I mentioned, and you'll see a little bit more about some of them. So our, we've been open officially since 2014 under the University of Maryland. Uh, we have our own airworthiness process, which is a product for us, but it's also a, di a differentiator because most of the test sites that are out there that are flying drones, they do not do any airworthiness evaluation. They either take the manufacturer's word for it or just manage the risk on a uh, kind of take it as it is basis. Uh, we have an actual airworthiness process based on the Navy's airworthiness process because it works and the FAA recognizes it, so we use it. So we made the University of Maryland airworthiness process out of that. We get extended uh, flight authorizations from the FAA to fly in the national airspace with drones, and we've flown very large effect, which you'll see in a second. Uh, lots of projects, lots of vehicles. The big thing, the big takeaway is they're all collaborative. We very rarely do one project with one customer. Uh, usually multiple customers, multiple technologies all working together. Uh, we're the ones that actually get them put together, integrated, and working together. And we really do cross all those boundaries. This is a hey Matt. Five. Yes. Sorry to interrupt your flow. Your your mic sound went down a little low on us. I'm okay. not sure what happened. Okay. I will hold it up a little bit closer. I'll see. I'm not, it might be the uh, computer sharing thing from the videos, but is that a little bit better? That is a little bit better. Okay. So we'll just press ahead here. Yep. Uh, so these are a real wide variety of folks. Uh, federal agencies, uh, the military, the Navy, and Army are both two of our biggest customers, ARL up at Aberdeen. NASA has become a very large book of business for us, uh, but we still work with NOAA and all the other ones up there. A lot of different active institutions besides University of Maryland and even USM schools, uh, the Naval Academy, the Ohio State, uh, Virginia Tech, others, uh, county governments, state governments, and then industry from Lockheed Martin down to small mom and pops. That one very bottom center there, Amrock Technologies, they did not exist four years ago. They were a couple of Virginia Tech and UMD folks that got together. Uh, decided they needed to do something in this uh, drone economy and went after unmanned aircraft system traffic management, UTM. Uh, and now they are probably one of the top four or five in the world doing that. So uh, just been really excited to be part of this uh, ecosystem as it ended up. And we make ourselves available to the community, this collaborative community. This is our large conference room. We get to name everything. So this is the fearless conference room, ninjas down the hallway. Uh, fearless conference room we make available to our community partners to have meetings. The Navy uses this quite a bit, so they don't have to drag people through the security knot hole to get on base. Uh, and that is an aircraft that you'll hear a little bit more about uh, in a couple minutes. So we do a great uh, community collaborative uh, taste. And really what it all comes down to, what we really try to get people to focus on is the research and development. What's it really about? It's about their requirements. It has nothing to do with the aircraft to start off with. It's what do you need to do? What do you need to be doing? What are the tools you need? Then if it involves a drone or ground autonomous or maritime autonomous vehicle, let's figure out how that works. What does the user need? What does the FAA need for the regulations part? And what do the end users, the people that are waiting for the service, what do they need? We actually help people figure all that out 
get it all together and figure out what the resources are that are needed to make it happen, put it all together, integrate it, and then go fly. So that design and integration piece is our bread and butter. These are some of our interns that have worked with us in the past. And uh, it's about that system of systems, tying everything together, make sure it works, doing the error risk evaluation. And really that bottom line is on the bottom right there. It's pathway to data. We really don't want people to think about the aircraft. We want them to think about what is it you need to go do your job. We will help you get it. We'll help you figure out what the platform is to get it there. So some of the ways we do that, this is a Tiger Shark aircraft. Uh, we got 11 of these from the Navy. Uh, it's a great truck. We just use it to get stuff airborne. It'll haul about 50 or 60 pounds of payload. That's about a 20 foot wingspan aircraft, 300, 400 pounds, depending on the payload. So it's a really nice uh, vehicle for us. But as in any kind of research, you learn more from your failures than you do from your successes. This was Tiger Shark nose number one. And we flew this under a Navy project. And luckily, all the VIPs had just walked away when we finished uh, the project. And uh, we had an issue. We found out that the software didn't really understand when it was on the ground and when it was in the air. It thought it was on the ground and when it was actually in the air and ended up in this uh, configuration. So we learn our lessons, too. And Tommy showed you a lot of 3D uh, with cool stuff, guitars and all kinds of stuff. We do use it to make drone parts because we don't deal with the same stresses that manned aircraft do. So this is in full-time operation, especially when our interns are around during the summer. Unfortunately, not this year, but most summers we have uh, five interns with us, and this thing's running 24-7. Uh, where do we go? A lot of test sites bring people to them and fly at their locations. We go where they need, to, need us to go to fly. So we do fly all over the state except around Washington, D.C. You can see UMD campus is inside the flight restriction zone around Washington, D.C. That's why we can't fly on campus. We help them build, build the fearless flight facility, which is a netted facility just off campus up there. But we go all over the state of Maryland. We're located at the St. Mary's Airport next to the Naval Air Station at Pax River. Uh, across the bay from us at Crisfield in the public airport there, we fly out of there when we need to fly slightly larger stuff. And we do have a relationship with Wallace. But at the bottom there, you can see all the different places we've been, and literally, it's been around the world. When you look at that bottom line of Belize, Dominica, Thailand, Bahamas, we don't fly in the garden spots. We usually show up right after a hurricane or some other natural disaster and haul generators up into the mountains, things like that. So we go where we need to go. One of the systems we use to do that is our mobile operations center. This was funded under a state grant. It's a great opportunity for us to take two tiger sharks on the road and support our operations with air conditioning, heating, towers, uh, a fully networked system to be able to control the aircraft and the data. And this is in bay one of our three bays in our research hangar. As far as air vehicles, we have a pretty wide selection of everything from very small quads, some stuff we got from the military, some hybrid VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles that you see dead center there. And we also have access to other people's vehicles because we have to own the vehicle to fly it under our airworthiness authorizations. So the one on the bottom right, you can't really tell because of scale. That's a 33-foot wingspan aircraft. It's gas-powered, heavy fuel, diesel fuel kind of uh, aircraft. That flies for 10 days. So it's currently working under Navy contracts. Uh, we are part of that operation, uh, getting flight authorizations and doing research with that. So we do fly with other people's vehicles as well as our own. We've done a lot of different types of things. I'm going to touch on just a few of them as we get towards the end of our time here. Uh, one of the things we do like to focus on, though, is things that help people, humanitarian uses, uh, safety, public safety, things like that. So that has been kind of one of our drivers, uh, one of the reasons that we try to focus in on for certain projects. So we do work with the Navy down here at Pax River and uh, at large. You can see the different types of technologies we work with. The nice thing from our point of view is all of these things, besides being military technology areas, they're also applicable to the civil and commercial use and two of the highest priority ones are those two bottom ones in red, cybersecurity and counter UAS. A drone is nothing more than a laptop with wings. You can hack a laptop, you can hack a drone. And that is actually the leading counter UAS way to get them down. So that's uh, two areas that we do focus on quite a bit. One project we did with the Navy and we we're doing other things with and to show our multi-domain aspect was Emily. It's a lifeguard boat that we uh, tied in with our drones. We actually controlled the boat through the drone and using the drone as eyes over the horizon. So a real nice way to extend the visibility of the system, but also the operations of the system over the horizon. So multi-domain is one of the things we do. We also have done some ground robot uh, work with the Indian head just north of us. As 
I said, humanitarian is a big deal. Drones at large are a very big component of disaster response now. The FAA used uh, 2017 as kind of their turning point with Har Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. They have 375 drone operations during those hurricanes. Uh, nobody looks back since then. Uh, everything is online, fast turnarounds, uh, things like that. Uh, so we've been to Dominica and Bahamas for post-hurricane, uh, partnering up with Global Medic as the uh, nonprofit there. And the direction that really people want to go is not to replace people, but to team with people, have manned, unmanned teaming so that we can actually accomplish more and offload the things that we want to have drones do to the drones and keep manned responsibilities and decision making where we need to. So back in 2016, we flew a project uh, using that aircraft you see on that jump shoulders there. Uh, it was the aircraft that was in the conference room earlier in the brief. We flew medical package across the bay. About 11 mile, 12 mile flight, 20 minutes, uh, pretty straightforward, pretty easy, fully automated. We didn't touch the aircraft from takeoff to landing. Everything was uh, fully controlled by the computers. On the other side, the gentleman in the lower left there came out to the aircraft, picked up the medical stuff, took it to Dorchester County Hospital, and they used it. So it was the first medical and the first civil commercial cargo delivery in the state of Maryland by drone. But right after that, we got a call. And to show what that call entailed, I want to run this quick video. Dr. Scalia is in place, correct? Correct. Hommel's per, Hommel is functional. We're ready to receive the organ. Roger. And one last time, UMMC, helipad clear, and CISCOM. And, and you guys are ready to receive the organ, correct? Accurate. It's cleared for launch. Let's make some history. Launch. We're launching. <laughs> Aircraft is airborne. We want to prove that this can work, that we can safely transport an organ, even if it were a few short miles, safely, uh, you know, from, from point A to point B and, and reach that waiting recipient. <laughs> okay, Mr. Anna, we're good. We have technologies now that allow the unmanned transportation of really any payload. And what we've done is try to innovate those systems to allow our patients better access to higher quality transplantable organs. I think the modes of transport, you know, should be expected to evolve over time and this seems to be a natural evolution of, of how we transport things. Maintaining 91 meters altitude, 10 meters per second. We want to be part of that project and take it from this stage of short visual line of sight and then someday working up to aircraft like this that will fly tens and hundreds and again with a different aircraft, thousands of miles. Time in air, four minutes, 30 seconds. Approaching Martin Luther King, 100 meters. All right, aircraft has successfully landed. I'm disarming the vehicle. Oh, vehicle has disarmed itself. I'm approaching the vehicle to hardware disarm. All right. Confirming Hommel's active. Temperature is appropriate. Organ doesn't appear to be injured at all. Looks like a perfectly transplantable organ. One small hop for a drone, <laughs> one major leap for medicine. This is a major step towards reinventing the way that the current system of organs are moved. And I think we can help a lot of people this way. Might take a long time, but it's the first step. Go team. Awesome. <laughs> so to say that I was on a little bit of pins and needles during that flight uh, was an understatement. Uh, the, that's the money shot you see right there on the screen now uh, as the aircraft approach. The people you see on the helipad, uh, just off the helipad there on the top of UMMC shock trauma in downtown Baltimore, those are doctors and nurses who heard about what we were doing and wanted to be there, wanted to see this because they knew that this was the future. Uh, and they literally broke out in cheers. It was just a great experience. Uh, we are continuing to work with this. Uh, for those of you who know the, the Plank family, Scott Plank uh, is a developer in Baltimore after his Under Armour career. He has invested in a company that has turned this into a commercial operation. They are going to start drone operations in downtown Baltimore this summer. So please stay uh, tuned for that and uh, look for that to happen. Uh, the last piece I want to show, uh, talk about here is the Innovation District. 
uh, all the stuff we're talking about here really is this innovation district. Uh, the county invested, uh, working with Tortigalis uh, last year in this plan to create the plan of what could it become. I showed you that diagram of what the airport looked like in the past and kind of today where the construction is. You saw the drone flight over. You kind of see this is the future. This is the plan that's been approved. It's available online. You can Google St. Mary's County Innovation District, uh, whatever you want to, combination you want to use. You can find it, read it. It's a really straightforward plan. But now we have something to latch on to, to hang things on and to guide our development. So the Innovation District is just like any Innovation District. It's a geographic thing. It's a place where you can put people, ideas, things, and have some place to focus around. So the Innovation District is one of two or three in the county of St. Mary's County that we're focusing on to create this thing. Uh, and it's really starting to happen with the pieces that I've shown you already, U.S. Test Site, Techport, and U.S. MSM, all part of this Innovation District. So this is the existing uh, infrastructure. You have Route 235, Three Notch Road, running uh, northwest to southeast of the airport. One small road will have to be built out here on the far left to, to the west of the airport to create a perimeter road. But they've really targeted basically a one mile circle around the airport uh, to be the development area. And there's actually some green areas in there that we're respecting. And green, urban, I'm sorry, rural and water is a big part of our tradition in St. Mary's County. We want to retain those characteristics. So this is what the innovation district will look like. And if you go online and look at the plan, it gives you the color coding. Uh, the yellow is residential. The purple is aviation operations. Uh, some retail is in there. A lot of research. The orange spaces are research, industry, innovation. So about uh, a third of this stuff exists today. The yellow, the outline areas kind of things are all things to happen. So we're very excited about being part of this. But even more so, we're excited to have you come see us. Uh, come down to the airport, uh, make appointments with us if you'd like. Uh, give us, give you a shot, give you a shout. Uh, we'll take you on a tour, show you what we have going on. We're very happy and proud of what we have going on, but we know we need more. Uh, we're talking to developers in College Park, the research community in College Park, the business community, everybody to come on down, and be part of this uh, thing that we have going on. And these are really the takeaways. It's, Focusing on the research and development, not only we need, not only what the Navy needs, but what the nation, what the world needs to move everybody forward with autonomy and unmanned technologies, uh, to diversify our economy in the lower Southern Mountain region, to take advantage of that federal dollar that now expanded into the civil commercial sector. And the third piece that we needed is that education. Keep educating not only today's workforce, but to tomorrow's workforce and doing it with relationships and by exercising those leadership roles. And that's all part of what we've been doing today. So hopefully uh, you all got something out of the presentation today. Uh, and I'm going to pull up the chat and stop sharing and have Beverly come back in. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm very excited that you were able to share this with our regional folks and folks across the country that are part of the, you know, Terp Nation and really showing how entrepreneurship and innovation is taking flight right here in Southern Maryland. Um, so if anyone has any questions for Matt, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself or pop a question in the in the chat. We've got a couple minutes here if you have anything you want to ask him before we sign off for the day. I do see one question down there, and then please, folks, pipe in. Uh, there was one about how do you gain access to the incubator or rent space in it. Uh, I, I think it is similar to the Diamondback Garage. Uh, you just get in touch with Tommy via the website, uh, Tommy Rudenville. Uh, and let start start the conversation. And he is very, very flexible, as you probably got from the video, uh, with who comes in, how they come in, what they need. But he will have a very frank conversation with you about what we offer down here, what you need, see where the match is between those two, and then make it happen. Fantastic. Any other questions from our viewing audience today? Well, Matt, I'll just attest that no questions means you covered everything perfectly. Thanks, Beverly. It was really a pleasure uh, having everybody in. I'm sorry we couldn't do this uh, physically, but as soon as we do open up a little bit more, my team started working last week. We were actually the first University of Maryland Research Enterprise uh, location to open up. Uh, we're 50% open right now, so my guys are touching airplanes and happy again. So uh, really happy that we could do this and really thankful for the alumni, Angela and Beverly, uh, making this all happen and pulling it together.
Well, we certainly thank you for inviting us into a sneak peek of what's going on.